Hello, um, and a very warm welcome to you all for this webinar on business and social justice. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. Um, my name is Priya Rajeshekar. I've been a co-convener on the business and social justice course. I'm also a program manager in the digital learning team at CISL. I'm joined by two very distinguished guests today. Um, Elspeth Donovan is a fellow at CISL, a co-convener on the business and social justice course, and she's also head tutor on the course. I'm also joined by Janet Poe, um, who has been a participant on this course and has had a very long uh, and very distinguished career as a Chief Sustainability Officer and Chief of Staff with the Lloyds Banking Group. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how business needs to transcend the paradigm of justice as just us. But before I do that, I would like to start with a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, the first thing is that uh, I would like to let you know that this call is going to be recorded uh, and it will be shared on YouTube in case you're not able to sit through the entire session. Uh, the other thing is that towards the end of the session, we do have a Q&A, but if in the interim you have any questions that you would like to post to uh, the panelists, please feel free to do so. Uh, these may also relate to the course and uh, we, we have a colleague who will be picking up those questions and responding to you via the chat function. So. Um, the webinar today is about transcending the paradigm of justice as just us. Uh, I wanted to take a couple of moments to talk about the course and the way we have designed it as a way to address this very question. So uh, you may have heard uh, from the special UN Rapporteur who spoke recently about uh, the current economic system and how it continues to exploit people and the planet and, and nature. And this is really important for us to realize because he also said that there seems to be something wrong with the way we think, the way our brain works, that we're not able to realize how serious the situation is. The reason the situation is serious is because perhaps we don't quite understand what it is like to experience this reality on the ground. And understanding this through the prism of social justice allows us to do some of that. So on the course, what we have done is we've tried to translate the abstract into practical action that you can take on the ground as business professionals. And in order to do that, we have created a framework for you to think through and to work with. But this is not all. We also have uh, the opportunity where you can uh, co-create with students and participants who are coming from all around the world, drawing in the, their experience. So there is an active co-creation happening here as well. And we would like to talk about all of this and more in the session today, but I don't want to take too much of your time doing that. We'll go straight over to the panelists. My, quest, my first question is for you, Elspeth. Uh, if I can ask you to kindly introduce yourself briefly, uh, talk about the title uh, and what we mean by that really, and also uh, dwell a little bit on your experience working with business professionals for several decades and how you've seen this whole landscape change and the kind of urgency that we are now seeing with the climate crisis and how the social dimension is such an integral part of this uh, conversation. Thanks, Priya. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, lovely to be with you. Uh, as Priya said, I'm the head tutor on the Business and Social Justice course, and it's always wonderful to work with Priya on developing it. I will say a little bit about myself as I talk about my journey, so I won't start with that, but I'll start with the title and where did that come from? And it was me because I uh, we had a wonderful uh, public prosecutor called Tuli Madoncello. She's quite famous globally, but locally she's a professor, distinguished professor at one of our universities. And she said, if we are to truly secure our freedom for all, we need justice for all. And this means that transcending the paradigm of justice as just us. I think we had and in the title, but it should really be as just us. And so what is really important about the statement is uh, privilege is invisible to those who have it, but is very visible to those who don't have it. And just to get these terms so that we understand what we mean by justice is if we're talking about equality, this is based on the assumption that everyone benefits from the same support. So you get the same support. Equity means that everybody gets the support they need, which is really what affirmative action was, but and is. But justice is the systemic barriers that are causing this uh, injustice have been removed. So it allows, so this the cause of the inequity has been addressed. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about social justice is justice is working with the system and those barriers have been moved. So that's where the title of move from justice, um, the paradigm of justice, not meaning just us, but it's actually meaning everybody. So really important to understand why we phrased it like that. 
So my background is uh, not business, it's science. And I started out by really understanding how the ecology works. So, um, and so really understanding how the ecosystem works. And then I became interested in how a human body works. So I then became interested in well-being, so at the cellular level. So I had these two different views of systems. And yet, of course, a human system is exactly the same as a natural system and vice versa. And then, of course, I've spent most of my life in Southern Africa, so I'm based right now in Cape Town. And so around me was a lot for me to pay attention to and wonder what on earth and why and last lots of questions and curiosity. And I just re realized that people's lack of knowing and lack of awareness and where that's where education became so critical to So, how do we make people aware of what's going on around them and why it's not okay and in terms of now and for the future in all aspects of, of the environment and people. So I became really interested. So who's going to do that? Um, certainly not gonna be a scientist. Well, obviously scientists have an important role. So I always thought, well, maybe business will get that right. So I decided to take myself off to business school and learn about how business works and start to work in businesses so I could understand their thinking. But what I realized that they don't, they don't understand themselves or the world and the psyche is all wrong around what we think about, what we value. And it really speaks to Donella Meadows when she talks about that complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. We treat it as though it's divisible, separate, and infinite, simple. And this is what was being talked in business. And it was just really worrying for me. So I started to think, what do you do about that? You have to start with leadership development. You have to start with helping people at all levels in the organization understand that what we're doing is not okay. It doesn't make any sense. We live in this extractive, exclusive, excessive and um, world, and it's not going to get us where we need to go. So I really started to be involved in, in curriculum development and teaching and various things, and actually ended up uh, working for CISL in South Africa with their work because they were particularly interested in somebody who had more of a social performance focus. So that's why I was drawn into this work although I had been doing it all along, but really just calling it leadership development, but it was through the lens of sustainability. And so, I mean, it's, and then also got myself on various boards, particularly education institutions, as well as businesses. And then at the moment, I'm, a, I'm a, on the board of a shareholder activist company, which is really important, the work that they do, and really using evidence to show that many organizations, um, their particular focus is the financial sector, in this part of in South Africa are actually not saying doing what they're saying they're doing and they provide really good evidence of this so it's a constantly being a watchdog for making sure that corporates understand what is required so is the shift happening it is happening I think that because the environmental challenges are so stark I think that businesses globally are really understanding them um, more but um, I always think this the social issues are more difficult for people to understand unless you live where I live. And then that's, that's you walk out your door and you see the social issues. I think it's really important that, um, but they're actually the same thing. We shouldn't be separating these two things. Environmental and so social justice are completely interconnected and interrelated. And they, and I think the social aspect, the social implications are less well understood. I, I must admit it is, it is improving, but I think we need to work with the way people think. Um, and that's quite a big challenge for, um, for us in terms of, of education and how we deliver programs. So that's really why I ended up doing what I do. But, um, and I think that I know uh, we, Janet will speak more about ESG because she's an expert at that but I often think the S is the scary bit of the ESG people seem to understand the E and the G but what is the S and yet they're all the same thing so I hope that answers your question yes yeah. thank you so much Elspeth I think again you know what's what's coming to the fore is the fact that uh, we need collaborative action we need to hear from as diverse uh, a group of people as possible for us to be able to understand 
uh, to be able to understand what how these challenges translate on the ground because we have terabytes of facts and data the problem is us not having access to the kind of experiential wisdom that can only come when we listen to people from diverse stakeholders um, I want to move on to you now, Janet, if that's okay. Um, you know, uh, social justice is a very contested theme. People have various notions of it, and we can all agree that we'll never agree on what it actually is. Um, but I just wanted to ask you uh, to briefly introduce yourself and then talk about how your notion of social justice has been transformed by as a result of you taking the course and uh, meeting so many different people from around the world. Lovely. Thank you, Priya, and, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as I got um, much older, I was going to say more senior, but older, more established in my career, I've understood that, that trying to explain things by giving examples is probably the easiest way to create understanding. And so I will use Lloyds Bank, which is the organisation that I've worked at for the last 15 years. I retired from executive life just before Christmas, shortly after taking the course, in fact. Um, and have moved into a world that involves a lot of work with charity, which has been hugely informed by some of my learnings on the course. But most of my kind of concrete examples, which I'll leave with you, are drawn from Lloyds Bank, and hopefully they'll be instrumental in creating some understanding. So, as I say, I worked for Lloyds for 15 years. Um, a, a, a decade ago, I became responsible for an area that was called responsible business in Lloyds Bank, which was really all the kind of philanthropic things that Lloyds was doing wrapped up in a little bundle. So Lloyds has the largest um, charitable foundations in the UK. Um, it was supporting our chief executive in about 2011, had a nervous breakdown, was the first FTSE 100 chief exec to kind of confess that the reason he was taking time off was that he'd had a nervous breakdown and we'd become very involved with mental health charities because he was prepared to be the poster child for trying to um, reduce the stigma of, of mental health challenges that people frequently have in, in the workplace and, and in other circumstances. So I'd got the charitable work and then I'd acquired along the way responsibility for the company's inclusion and diversity goals. And so in 2014, Lloyd's became the first uh, FTSE 100 company to declare a target for women in senior management and it kind of paved the way for quite a lot of initiatives that, that other companies happily copied and so women are now making up a much more significant proportion of, of senior management in business life. But it was really confined to those things. Um, the government had, at the back of the financial crisis, the government had taken a 43% stake in Lloyd's Banking Group. And so we started to form some views around what we needed to do being not just to restore the bank to a place where it could make profit again, but actually to try to do the right thing by the UK because the UK taxpayer had done the right thing by Lloyd's Bank in taking such a significant stake in the bank. So there were some very easy things like don't close branches. Every time you open a newspaper or read a report on what's going on in banking, you'll hear people complaining about branch closure as, as something that impacts not just people's ability to access financial services, but for many, that visit to the branch is a bit of a social lifeline. People go to have a bit of a chat and and to, to make sure that they're doing the right things with their finances. It's not just a kind of transactional thing. Um, and also bank branches underpin many of our high streets and the minute the bank branch disappears so too does the local supermarket and the local Vodafone store where you can get your new telephone and and so on they're, they're such a fundamental underpinning of of the well-being of, of high streets and so we felt very strongly that continually closing branches even if they weren't terribly well used was not the right way of of seeking to support the UK as it emerged from the financial crisis which of course have been brought about by the financial institutions. So we felt that very strongly. So the debate within Lloyd's became, what more should we be doing? How can we put social justice elements closer to the heart of what we do as an organization? And we'd had for some time, this kind of strap line of helping Britain prosper. So we got quite deeply into what, what does prosperity mean? And what does it mean if you help some people to prosper, but you don't help everybody? How can you put a kind of, we used to talk in the UK in relation to um, the whole welfare state, we used to talk about it being a safety net, safety net so that people wouldn't 
fall through it, but we started to think about this concept of a trampoline so that people didn't just get caught when life got difficult, but actually you try to help people to bounce back. So in a banking context, that became things like there are many people who don't qualify according to standard criteria for borrowing money. And yet borrowing money in order to buy a home, in order to buy a car, in order to help your children with some tutoring so that they can do better at school. It's so fundamental to how a, a capitalist economy works that for a whole section of society to be excluded from the ability to participate in credit felt like something we ought to be ashamed of. And so we did work at Lloyd's around how can we help people to improve their credit scores? You know, what do they need to do over time in order that they can become more credit worthy and therefore be able to participate in something that helps the economy to work? So we started to kind of broaden this notion of, of the things that we ought to do. And in the last three years, we've been talking a lot about purpose and profit. And, and for a long time, those activities that I was responsible for, the kind of corporate social philanthropy work um, were seen as being at one, sorry, I'm holding my hand up, they were, they were kind of at one end of the continuum. And then at the other end, there was the profit that the organisation sought to make. And what we tried very hard to do, and we, we did it often visually, was to bring the two together so that the organisation would be committed to making profit, but in a much more purposeful way. Um, and we found that quite a good gimmick in terms of trying to help that to land with lots of colleagues was to get the chief financial officer to stand up and, and make a little speech about the importance of bringing purpose and profit together because he was always the person who'd be saying, well, you can't invest in this new thing or establish this new program because it will be the expense at the expense of our next quarter's earnings and our stock price will reduce. And so we started to talk a lot in terms of having a much more long-term perspective around what it meant to be prosperous and what it meant to be an organization that sought to uphold sustainability and inclusiveness. I think I'm going to stop there, otherwise I'm going to say all the other things that I'll probably need to say in relation to other questions, but but it's it's a journey and, and nobody's there yet, Lloyds Bank isn't there yet, but it has become more purposeful in the way it approaches the conduct of its business and I feel quite proud about that. Thank you, Janet. It's really quite fascinating to see, you know, the transition from thinking mechanistically about banks and profits and what banks do, and then to transition to thinking about the human story. And then suddenly everything changes. We're talking about participation, we're talking about capability, we're talking about a whole gamut of things, including inclusion. Uh, so I just wanted to go back to you, Elspeth, uh, and ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, how our course, uh, the way we've designed the business and social justice course, we've tried to um, move away from the abstract. The abstract is important because that's where we talk about politics, we talk about society, we talk about the human element. But business professionals, as Janet has just outlined, are uh, very much under pressure to meet those quarterly targets to keep business models working successfully. So can you talk a little bit about how we may have embedded some of those frameworks and tools to allow business professionals to think systematically about these more complex issues and how they can translate that into uh, credible action on the ground? Sure, thanks Priya. I was just having a little laugh to myself, Janice, you said you head up responsible business and I was wondering what is the rest of the business irresponsible? That was all. So it's such a weird title that, but it, it's very pervasive. But anyway, <laughs> just like with, oh wow, okay. Anyway, so just uh, in terms of the program, we, we use the, the six dimensions of social justice, which was a framework developed by CISL back in 2016, obviously based on a lot of other work and a lot of research, but we found that was one of the easiest ways to present the, um, the program because it ensures that nothing is left out because it's all encompassing of all the issues that are obviously all terribly interconnected, but you can look at them slightly separately and so and I think what what a framework does is, is provide a scaffold something for you to hang your thinking on and I think that was that's what is important about the use of it and the other thing is the course is designed in a way that we ask the students to slow down and take a deeper dive to look into each one of these aspects before coming up with solutions because you know, in business, you've, you know, come on, give us a solution. How are we going to fix this? And it's one of the biggest problems that we we struggle with is you need to hold that notion of not knowing and then thinking about if I pause 
and think a little bit more deeply, maybe new ideas will come. So that's how we, we deliver the course and using, so I call it going slow to go fast. I think the students get quite used to my mantra, remember to go slow, to go fast, because unless you do the upfront work, then everything is going to be slowed down later because you will have forgotten something. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you never quite get going. It's just this notion of pause, reflect, then think and then take action. So the six dimensions, just very uh, quickly, just so you get a sense of what's covered is, the first is equi equitable distribution of costs and benefits. Really important. Um, anything to do with business is somebody, um, business definitely benefits, but who else benefits from it? But there's also co costs implicated in, um, in running a business and often their environmental costs, these are impacts, but they're also social impacts. And I think a lot of the work I've done has been in the mining industry and that's it's very quite stark, um, the, the sort of the, the costs and benefits and how do you ensure that that's equitably distributed uh, amongst people who are around your operations and also using your products. Then the next one is the full recognition of needs and rights. So really important that we acknowledge different needs and different rights of all people inside the organization as well as out. So all of these things are internal and external. How do we make sure there's equal participation in decision-making so all the stakeholders feel somehow they've had a contribution to decision-making? Again, this all sounds completely outrageous and take too long, but if you think carefully about it and plan properly, it won't. But we give you lots of ideas to think about. Then there's equal capabilities to function and fulfill your potential, which is very much based on the work of Marta Sen and Martha Nussbaum. But really think about how do you allow people to reach their full potential? And I think particularly in the country where I live, so much is lost because we don't let people get to their full potential and able to use it. And then justice over time, which is across generations. Are we good ancestors? And I thought I'd just share a lovely uh, sort of a good news story about understanding ancestors from one of our contributors, who's Sinagugu Sikulu, who's on the program, and he's a stakeholder engagement, but he works for an organization called Sustaining the Wild Coast. And they re recently took on through legal means, because they had a legal right, um, a large oil company doing some inappropriate activity off the coastline and this particular community is exactly where they live for some reason weren't consulted and that fortunately in our world in my world where I am that's not allowed you have to consult everybody and I think what was really interesting was one of the issues they brought up was this is ancestral this is where our ancestors are this is an ancestral place for us and that was like a, a, a big wake up call for a large corporation that doesn't sort of think like that. So alternative sources of knowledge, really understanding wisdom and thinking about those things. So it's just recently, unfortunately, it's gone back to court, but at, for the first round, uh, the, the, real, the right people got their say and got heard, and we hope that it'll still continue that way. But just really important to understand the importance of justice over time, because that's what this is all about. Decisions we make now impact the future. And then, of course, there's justice over space, which is over locations across uh, borders and things like that, and really under, understanding the importance of that. So that's really what the program takes you through before you think about, so what? how do we push those boundaries? And we get you to do, the students to do that, the participants. And what is the leadership required to do that? We really, really get interrogate different forms of leadership and what would be appropriate leadership before we start to say, okay, so what action are we going to take and how are we going to work collectively together in a collaborative way? So that's really a sort of broad kind of underpinning of how the program works. Thank you so much, Elspeth. That was uh, really insightful. So I just wanted to uh, remind participants again that, you know, we do talk about DEI and a number of them might be coming from these backgrounds. So we do talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, but we look at it from a broader lens. We move on to human rights. And I think, you know, what's happening around climate legislation around the world is now enough reason for us to sit up and take notice of the fact that, you know, we cannot continue to separate 
artificially the social from the environmental they are so integral so interconnected as your anecdote from Sinegugu uh, evidences quite clearly but we also look at it from a much much broader perspective of social justice and also draw in indigenous voices their struggles and how we uh, uh, illustrate that you know uh, culture is as much an aspect of space and time as anything else and then to just talk talk about people making a living is not quite enough in terms of justice we need to think about how their culture is impacted how their knowledge how their self, sense of self is impacted and so on so really it's not a hierarchical top-down approach of business intervening in society it's more about learning together and solving problems together so i just want to move on to you now janet and uh, if i could ask you to uh, unpick a little bit um, you know this concept of esg and the s in between uh, we've seen a, a trend in the us where you know shareholders are clamping down on businesses trying to uh, act more pro be more proactive in the space but i think uh, it's going to be a temporary uh, challenge because increasingly uh, even scientists this week said you know, we're looking at three three degrees and that's terrifying we can't continue to ignore the problem no matter what we do with the name or what it's called we have to go back to the social and there's no question about that so could you just unpack for uh, our participants today um, what those challenges are and how businesses could think beyond you know philanthropy and uh, be more part of the solution be more proactive recognizing the kind of transformative agency that they have uh, to drive change? Yes, so uh, I, I won't be able to give you a whole answer, Priya, because it's such an enormous topic. Um, but uh, just a few elements of, of the answer, which I think are quite important. A very long time ago in the 90s, I was privileged to be part of some work that the Labour Party um, did before it was elected in 1997. It was called the Commission on Social Justice. And it worked using a definition of social justice that kind of belonged in the 1990s. But one of the really, really significant learnings of that work, which was that drew on academic research um, worldwide, we were, we were thinking specifically about women and, and how we could improve the lot of women un, under an incoming Labour government. And, and one of the really critical findings from the Commission on Social Justice was that everything in a woman's life was impacted enormously by her role in the workplace. So her sense of well-being, her sense of self-esteem, her health status, whether she was likely to go on to you know, end up needing lots of healthcare treatment, how she looked after herself, how her children fed, was the big hopping off point was, does she have a job? And for the people who were stuck at home looking after children, they had low esteem, they had low health status, they didn't get out and about as much, and, and everything flowed from that. And so an enormous part of what the Labour Party sought to do when it was elected, and this isn't a parliamentary political broadcast in any sense, but it was such a big insight which kind of got me on this journey, was that if a woman has a job, everything else in her life will be better as a consequence of that, which is such an important learning, particularly for us women, to kind of, kind of hold on to. And, and so as, as I thought about that in relation to how Lloyd's would put together its social agenda, I made an enormous number of mistakes. And so even as recently as the year before last, Lloyd's was publishing its social sustainability report and its environmental sustainability report as though those two things were, were divisible. Um, and only just this Christmas, my, my younger daughter was, I can't remember who, who the author was, but she was reading a book called Climate Change is Racist. And it was seeking to bring together the notions, you know, that climate change, just as it doesn't respect boundaries, it doesn't respect social groupings, it impacts everybody and it disproportionately impacts those who are already having the hardest time. And I think I rather arrogantly thought, as somebody who'd been awoken to, or awakened to quite a few of these concepts quite early on, I kind of thought empathy was enough that I understood that, you know, I'd been overlooked and discriminated against and and I therefore understood how it might feel to be discriminated against if I were an ethnic minority in the UK but of course I didn't have the slightest idea about it because it just wasn't part of my experience set I had the ability to be empath empathetic about it but I had no ability to unlock what the, some of the solutions might be and so the Lloyd's thinking was really around how do we take some of these really good intentions like keeping the branches open and so on that I spoke to you about earlier to try to help, firstly, the workforce more closely resemble the communities that it serves, because you kind of need to start at home. That's an area where you've got particular agency. But then how could we help the bank's activities to be more socially mindful? 
And that started in a really significant way with COP26, when we had to think about publishing targets for carbon emission reductions. And it's one of the areas where I think the banks had kind of got away with it for a long time. So I, I will cheerfully admit Lloyds Bank funds 7% of all UK carbon emissions. So when Lloyds Bank commits to more than halving the emissions that it, that it finances by 2030, that's a significant reduction in carbon emissions. And, and you bring that pressure to bear by working with the companies that you lend money to. They want to borrow money. You bring the pressure to bear by working with them to try to figure out how they can become more sustainable. And so our social sustainability is kind of fundamentally bound up with our environmental sustainability and the impact that we could have as an organization was very bound up with environmental sustainability. But also, um, I mean, another example would be immediately after Black Lives Matter, as an organization, we thought hard about what our response should be, um, and it starts at home. So why were only 0.6% of our senior managers black? Um, what was stopping them making progress in the organization? And, and we didn't make the mistake of thinking that we knew. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking to black colleagues, talking to black entrepreneurs, talking to the black community about what banks should do to improve the offering, both so that they think about coming to work for us as employers. But, but more than that, they'd be promoted, they'd stay in the organization, they'd become more established entrepreneurs who could create more value for their communities and for the economy worldwide. And we started really to have this fundamental understanding that these things are not divisible in any sense, that you need to act on all of them all at once, really. And it's no excuse to kind of just pursue one set of targets without thinking about the breadth of initiatives that you need to bring to bear in order to create more social justice in your organization. Uh, and some of it, we talked about this a little on the course, I, I, I used to fear that I was becoming very boring because I'd taken the time to put together a team of people who were seeking to address issues of social justice within our organisation and more broadly in terms of how we conducted ourselves as an organisation. It needs some catalysts and it needs some people who build understanding. And for me, the course kind of brought together an enormous number of strands of thinking that had been kind of littering my brain over a long period of time uh, and enabled the organization. And I'm pleased to see that I just read their, their new ESG report, which was published with their report and accounts at the end of February. And it's weaving everything together. And the organization is taking huge pride in making more difference than it used to in, in more areas. So I, I think the S is being brought up by some organizations, but, but, but to try to treat it, I think, in isolation means that you miss what its potential can be. I think for my organization, shining a light on it and being very clear about what we meant by it was hugely important, but then it needs to be bound up with all the other initiatives that you're pursuing so that you make sure that you're examining the environmental, the sustainability and the governance angles in relation to everything that you do as a company. It's absolutely fascinating, Janet. I'm just uh, thinking back about what you said about, uh, you know, you're trying to get in touch with black people and trying to understand their experiences. I'm also wondering if, you know, we should be talking about intersectionality and how we often, you know, silo these things. We don't look at them uh, together. So uh, it's not just being black. It could be black and disabled. It could be black and from a certain geography. It could be black and working in a certain type of organization. And I think we need to have a whole gamut of ideas and thinking and insights to be able to unpack and understand this problem in all its complexity. Uh, and I just want to go back to you, uh, Elspeth, because, uh, you know, one of the things that I really like about the business and social justice course is, you know, the, the real diverse cohorts that we've seen, people from all around the world, and I'm talking about geographical diversity, I'm talking about every kind of diversity that one can think about. And I was just wondering if you could talk this uh, through your experience being a head tutor on the course and how the diversity has enriched the learning, because it's not just someone sitting in isolation, reading a book or reading a report and suddenly being up to date on what this whole beast is about. It's about talking to other people, sharing ideas, learning from each other. And I think that has been one of the fundamental strengths of this particular course, where people are so willing to share and make sure that you know they contribute to discussions and so on. So I just was wondering if you might uh, want to talk about that a little bit. Sure, thanks, Priya. I mean, I think I think one of the things 
you know, about the courses that people come with very different ge geographies, but also different experiences and different expertise to the program and different lens through which they're looking at things. And I think the first thing that they all discover at the same time um, through is that is the structural nature of injustice. And how it's, it's structured into society in such a way and, and, and kind of unseen. And, and suddenly by talking about it together and saying what they you know, what's happening in their context and each other's, it suddenly becomes seen and they understand that this is something that's that's got a legacy to it, but you know, we need to dismantle it. And 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 it's really interesting to see that that sort of together, this understanding, okay, this is a really structural issue. Um, and so that's that's the one thing that I was think, seeing all these coming from very different backgrounds, different, but they all get to that place. The other one is this notion of rather than value extraction, they get to the understanding of value creation. And what does value creation look like when you take in and understand all these dimensions that we need to consider? So those are the two things that they they get come together as well. The other one is. Uh, suddenly realizing there's something called business and so, a corporate social justice rather than all the other corporate social somethings you know and so thinking of that as a much more appropriate term so just trying to think of um the things that they they get from each other but it's that shared learning in the discussion forums uh we use the discussion forums to help develop thinking towards the assignment this needs to be done for that module so you're thinking yourself then you're sharing your thinking with your participants who are then responding to your thinking and, and deepening your thinking so really again it's 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 a sort of a really collective co-created kind of course where everybody's sharing nobody's trying to do the best assignment but rather They've got a particular challenge in their context that they're starting to understand more from a structural nature. So how would that be dismantled or changed? And, and each assignment builds on the one that came before. And, the, and then your final assignment is the action that people are going to take. And, and then again, you share your thinking and people give you some guidance. And then once you've submitted, you also get more guidance because they give you feedback on what your final submission was. So I think it's a very much a sort of collective learning, co-created process where everybody ends up having a whole lot of outside thinking brought into their inside, what they're thinking about. And, and I think what is also important, often people think the S is just internal to the organization, but it's internal and it's external. And there's this really must be really clear. And I think that comes through quite strongly in the course. So, and then I always joke about them because I, we had, I had a blog written about it, this notion of being an activist or being an actionist. And I like to think that they're gonna go and take action. So they, they we make them feel like activists and then we say, okay, now you need to action it. So activist, actionist. So, Anyway, that was just my little thinking. But yeah, the diversity of the the group from very different geographies and in very different industries is really hugely um, impactful in terms of the learning and for my, my learning as well. Boy, do I learn a lot every time I go through the course. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Elspeth. I think it also disrupts our notion of hierarchy, you know, where someone uh, has a position of power and they're always talking down to everyone else. But here we have our participants challenging us constantly, um, you know, mentoring us sometimes, giving us ideas, sharing resources. And suddenly it becomes something that, you know, people have been talking about in the World Economic Forum, for instance, where we, we talk about a different kind of leadership that is required now because no one has all the answers. And leadership is no longer something that an individual does. It's something uh, that's more processed that is something that evolves over time as you know these new new challenges emerge we need to work together to try and resolve them um, I, I just wanted to move on to you now uh, Janet if I could ask uh, my final question to you which is um, you know what are your key takeaways from this course because you've been a mentor for so many participants and for us on the course you've shared so much of your ideas and insights uh, but I also wanted to ask you if there are any key takeaways that you might want to discuss with the participants on the webinar today so I think what the course does is to really make us think differently and once you start thinking differently you can approach your problem solving in a different way so and, and again I'm going to do it by example because I think, just think that makes it come alive so you, you may remember that um, we had a very short-lived Prime Minister called Liz Truss 
under whose leadership um, in the UK this is, under whose um, premiership interest rates went from kind of 2% to 6%. Um, and the, the country was in a big panic for 42 days. Um, and so at a, an executive committee meeting at Lloyds Bank, we sat down and said, well, we've had this purpose of helping Britain prosper for a, for a long time. What should our response be? You know, how, how, what will be the responsible way, not the irresponsible way else, but what will be the responsible way of responding to this? And I was hugely pleasantly surprised. And I kind of, you know, I think maybe some of my cajoling helped here. But we went to the fellow who ran the mortgage business. So you know, he's targeted on how many new mortgage loans do you make and how much profit do you make from mortgages. So we said, so what have you, what have you done? And he said, I have capped at 3% the rate that we're going to charge for people who are borrowing 150,000 pounds or less, which isn't a perfect proxy for poorer people because some rich people might still have a very small mortgage for some reason, but generally speaking, if you were borrowing £150,000 to buy a home, you'd be at the poorer end of the market. So for those loans, for a period of about three or four months, Lloyd's capped at 3% the rate that it was charging. It could have been charging 6%. It probably could have gone up to 7%. But as an organisation, we'd done the right thing because we'd been able to charge 6 and 7% to the rich people on their, on their big fancy mortgages. And so we'd had the uplift in our profit that came because rates had gone up. But we tried very hard to, to make sure that the people at the bottom end of, end of the pile didn't suffer quite as much when they came off their fixed rate and suddenly discovered that their mortgage was much more expensive than it had been previously. And so for me, a, a, a big takeaway is the use in bringing together the elements of the framework and trying to take decisions in a way that consider the different elements of the framework you actually take decisions that it, sometimes you arrive at different decisions. Sometimes you may arrive at the same decision, but you bring different processes to bear. And I think it just makes you much more thoughtful as an organization if you if you seek to think about all of the perspectives. And we, kind of going back to my CO2 emissions, I, I knew that I wouldn't still be working for Lloyds Bank in 2030. Many of the people who are making decisions in Lloyds Bank today won't still be working there in 2030, even though we're in 2024. It would be the easiest thing in the world for them to say, I don't really care too much about the carbon emission reduction targets because I won't be here to see them through. So but as an organization, you need to know that you need to make progress every year. And Priya, you helped us. We talked a lot about targets and, and key performance indicators. It's really important to kind of drive with headlights on and know that you've got some way of capturing whether you're making progress or not. So I think the frameworks People have good intentions, but unless you have great frameworks and good measurement systems, you can always go a bit off track. So, so that was the, the, the hugest, most valuable takeaway from me. It's, it's, there are things that you can hang all of this on to make sure that you make progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, I just want to move on to uh, Berenice now and ask if there are any questions from the audience that we need to pick up uh, first before we move uh, this time for uh, other general things that we might want to talk about that we may have missed so far? Yes, we do have some questions. Um, I'll start with one that has been shared um, in advance to, to this uh, webinar. Um, and it says, I am part of communities team at South Cambridge uh, Shear District Council. My role is working with planners to encourage developers to include effective social community infrastructure into new developments, such as community buildings, green space, or play provision. We also know that commercial services such as shops, cafes, um, form part of community provision, which often come later in a development than we would like due to concerns over financial viability or food. Any thoughts on ways to encourage a social justice approach with developers? Janet, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a full answer. It's a brilliant question and, you know, one of the most significant problems of our time, I think, because we all know, I mean, in, in the UK, there's a very well-established number, which is that we need 300,000 new housing units every year to keep up with demand for housing. Um, but it's not good enough to, I mean, and we're not getting anywhere close to that. We're not even building 100,000 a year, but, but there's no point building homes if they don't have infrastructure around them to make them work, if they don't have the facilities that the questioner was asking about, schools and medical facilities and, and, and so on. So I, I think one of the critical elements is making sure that the politicians are involved, because at the end of the day, 
it's the politicians who ultimately will give planning permission for those developments to take place. Um, and, and with those come requirements about the amount of social housing that might be established on a, on a new housing development. But I, I got involved years ago, I used to chair a little local infant school in a really prime part of Camden Town in the centre of London and developers were trying to get hold of it all the time. And so we said, well, you can have this space if you build us a new school. And while you're at it, we don't just want an infant school, we want an infant school and a junior school that goes all the way through to age 11 and you really get their attention and the politicians said you won't get planning permission to do what you want to do here the school may be willing but you won't get permission unless you build the school and you build it to our standards and you build it so that it's a valuable resource for this community so i think the politicians are a part of it but I, I, th there are other elements that still don't work so it, it's it's good to to build affordable housing or to build some elements of affordable housing, but how do you help people to get on that ladder? So one of the forms of housing tenure that we have in the UK is called shared ownership. And one of my things that I've been doing post my executive life is working on an organization called the Shared Ownership Council, which looks at how people who have a very small deposit that they can put towards a mortgage can still get on the housing ladder by taking over one of those affordable housing units in a way that allows them to be both a mortgage payer and and a rent payer for a period and so over time that their rent starts to build up some ownership in the property that they're part of and that's fine for the new people who go into those um, that form of housing tenure but it's not fine in terms of what happens when you want to move because it's so little understood there are only 200,000 social ownership uh, constructs in across the whole of the UK and what we desperately need is for there to be more so I, this is a, t a tiny partial answer but I think the politicians have a, have a role to play and need to lay on more requirements um, and then I think th the things that are missing in terms of how this will work for all the different stakeholders need to be properly attended to. Thank you Janet. Elspeth do you want to add to that? Well, it were interesting enough when I saw the question, one of the students on this last cohort of business and social justice um, was tackling the same problem in Minneapolis, um, sort of also spurred on by uh, the George Floyd murder, how the, the sort of the, the city of Minneapolis needs to really think about itself and how people live together. And so, I mean, I think the key thing is, um, I, I don't know the UK policies, I don't know America's policy, but but it's she applied the lens of design thinking to her to her project. Is that how, who do you bring in to discuss all the different and and I think Janice mentioned the politicians, but who who are going to live there? Who who what are other people? So try and think about all the people that would be able to contribute to how this would look to satisfy all the different stakeholder needs. So it's a it takes a little bit of time, which is also this going slow to go fast, but how do you make sure you consult? And what also, I think whenever you talk about housing, you you know, there's one thing about getting a house, but is it a home? And so it's understanding that notion of what is a home for some people. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just really consulting wide, wildly, widely, but maybe using a design thinking framework to something we discussed in, in, the, in the course as well, just because that helps you think about every single stakeholder issue that they might have. Yeah, <laughs> no, I was just thinking about the same thing that we do talk about design thinking on the course. And again, it's about um, having a very systematic view of the problem um, and not just assuming things because we know everything. Um, but I, I wanted to go back to you, Ben, and say, are there any more questions that uh, have yeah. come up? We have three more and I hope we have enough time to go through them. Um, let me uh, go to um, one for Elspeth. Um, I remember Elspeth, you uh, mentioned go slow to go fast also in the Game Changers program. Um, I'm curious about the role of colonialism and the apparent lack of acknowledgement in Western nations about the harm that it caused. How is the issue of colonialism embedded in the work that you do and in this course? And how can slowing down help business understand their impacts in their activities and their links to the colonial past? 
Okay, well, yes, we do deal with colonialism in a big way in the course. It's very much what I call the structural nature of injustice, and we deal with that. And you know, it's a it's a strong thread of, of the program. I mean, I talk about um, slow violence. This is this unseen violence that happens to people, and little things that aren't sort of uh, sort of big noisy guns and things at the time but it's the other things that happen to people and 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 you don't see the impact of that for generations and so really having to understand that is really important so it's a big part of the course to think about the structural nature and particularly the impact of colonialism i think trying to i mean it's a strange thing to say to business please go slow to go fast but it it's I always say if you don't do that upfront work, then whatever you do will be sabotaged anyway, given our current um, environment where people know what's going on and they have a voice now and you can't get away with things you used to get away with. So if you don't make sure that you've thought about everything, you've thought more deeply about all the people that are going to be impacted, what you do, all the people that need to have got some ideas on how you could do something, uh, then your whole project, whatever it is you're wanting to do, will fail anyway. So do the upfront work, take the time, and it needn't, I'm not talking about years and years, I'm talking, it, it just depends on what it is that you want to do. So it's a, just a little reminder, stop, pause, think about who do you need to talk to, who could maybe assist with this, what, what are you not noticing, what do you need to let go of, and then once you've done all of that, you can then your project will take off from whatever it is you want to implement at a sort of faster pace. So I don't know if that helped, but certainly the structural nature of injustice caused by um, colonialism is a huge part of the course content. Yeah. Priya, could I just chip something in, which was one of the big learnings that I had from the course. So what we, we got into a case study on BHP, the Australian mining company, and how they'd carelessly, recklessly, with no thought, destroyed rock shelters, which were part of ancestral... And I just correct, it's uh, Rio Tinto, not BHP. I'm oh, sorry, Rio Tinto. Yes, I don't want to, <laughs> don't want to damn BHP. Um, and, and so they destroyed these um, rock shelters, and there'd been, a, 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 appropriately, a huge um, outcry in Australia, particularly among Aboriginal communities. Uh, and. Uh, quite a lot of very positive change flowed from it. Firstly, they were fine, so they couldn't ignore it. But then they needed to put their, their own house in order. And if you go on to the, the Rio Tinto website now, you can look at how they responded um, in a really, really good way. Now, you know, I'm sure some of it is is, is, is not as wonderful as, as, as the whole kind of expose would look, but it, it really showed how social justice thinking could be brought into the way companies conduct themselves and make for better outcomes. And, and if you've got Rio Tinto doing that, the other large companies can't ignore it. So it kind of catches everybody else in, in their wake. And I think from time to time, things happen that make for really significant change. And, and many of them are regrettable and awful, but it needs people who've been exposed to this kind of thinking to be able to figure out how they can grab the learnings and, and try and help them to go mainstream. And so, though I've been using the wrong company, as I've been quoting, um, it, it's been one of those things that I've talked about a lot, where, where an event can really make for a lot of difference and how we all need to be really good learners and figure out how we can do things better for the future. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, Benny, see any more questions? Yes. Um, this one, I think, is uh, for Janet. And it says, thank you so much for this conversation. This is tough work. And as Janet mentioned regarding Lloyd's finance in climate impacting areas, if we can take existing organizations and make them do more, we get huge impacts. How can we inspire people to balance constructively working with organizations as they are and still hold outrage for the injustices those same organizations have and are supporting? Yeah, you've just described my whole career, really. Um, so, so for a very, very long time, you know, I've, I've worked as a banker for my whole career, and so I've I've been kind of racked with what am I what am I propping up in our world that I feel ashamed of, and how do I help organ my organisation to to make progress for the future? And I, I felt immensely privileged to be given that set of responsibilities back in 2014, where 
haven't in any sense changed the world. I've not even changed the Lloyds Bank world as much as I'd love to have done. But I was given a responsibility for an area where I could start to make a difference. I could build a team who could build the organisational conscience and, and try to, to make more happen. And, and so I think what I'd say to the question, I thank you for your question. I think we're all individuals. We can try to, to unleash movements and from time to time we will. But I think as long as we try hard to make whatever difference we're able to make, it does become infectious. And, and you find, I mean, back to some of my earliest forays around women in senior roles, there aren't many FTSE 100 companies in the UK today that, that are getting, I think there are three or four that haven't yet got 30% of women in senior management, but they've got targets for it. And so I think there's a bit of a kind of a rising tide floats all boats element of, of this, which is that once, once enough start to do it, it becomes non-optional. And I do powerfully believe that our world is, is generally speaking, moving in more progressive directions. And so we just need to make sure that we don't res respond to some of the challenges that Priya mentioned earlier. We need to keep fighting the fight and making sure that we make difference happen wherever we can. When we were doing Black Lives Matter at Lloyd's, one of the fellows we were working with said, you are as anti-racist as the most racist thing you're prepared to walk past. And I think that applies to just about every element of social justice that you might consider. You're only as good as the as the thing that's that, that you're prepared to kind of compromise on and do nothing about. And, and I think that makes all of us feel that we'll never stop fighting. There'll always be injustice that we have to tackle. But but hopefully the, the army of people who are tackling it will get bigger and bigger as courses like this are more successful and, and more businesses realize that for their business to be sustainable into the future, they need to embrace these concepts. And that's about long-term thinking. And Elspeth was talking about about kind of systemized or also systemic analysis of, of issues. I think organisations are starting to understand that they won't be here in the future if they don't attend to injustice along the way. That that younger generation. I've got daughters who are 26 and 28. But they hold me to account constantly. I think that that emerging generation of, of people who are becoming more senior in the workplace won't let us get away with it. And thank you to them. Thank you, Janet. Um, Bernice, I think we have time for one more, about three minutes left. Um, yes, there's one around um, research for um, mothers who need to work for their own well-being. Um, and it says, interesting that evidence points to babies on, or toddlers needing one-to-one -one care for zero to, to three years. Um, old for best neurological development. Um, was there any suggestion that better support or greater valuing or of mothering or parenting could facilitate be better mental health for mothers? I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. Um, and the research is too old. This was back in about 1995. It's probably too old to have enough sensitivity to that. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry. I, I hate to kind of be to cop out on not being able to answer a question. But for me, the important point around you know helping women to 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 to, to be um, to have better well-being more generally, but it doesn't pick up the child the child angles at all. So I mean, I do think um, the primary caregiver is a really important in a child's life from the very beginning, whoever that is. So I think. And often that is the mother, um, and we don't acknowledge those roles in, enough in terms of contributing to the success of society, how well the children are looked after, you know, because that's the grounding. So I do think it's, uh, I think care, primary caregiver in any baby's life is really critical. It doesn't have to be the mother, and especially if it doesn't contribute to the mother's well-being. So I think, I don't know, I mean, but it's, it's a tricky one to answer because it's, contextual it just depends and uh, but I think what is important for a child is whoever the primary caregiver is um, is that person that makes them feel safe and listened to and that sort of thing yeah so thank you Elizabeth I think we're just coming to the final minute and I just wanted to add if I may that you know it's in places like this that I'm always thinking of cross-cultural learning 
we have so much to learn from African and Asian cultures, for example, about this very question and how they approach uh, you know, maternity and um, gender and all of the other things. And I think, again, the message is back to the social and the political and how we value everyone's knowledge. Um, and with that thought, um, I would like to thank everyone today for uh, being great participants. To you, Elspeth and uh, Janet, for uh, your sharing your insights so generously. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the chat and uh, feel free to get in touch with us via email. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Thank Thanks, Janice. Bye-bye.